All right, everybody, it's Michael Shermer here in the offices of Skeptic Magazine and the Skeptic Society. Amongst the many things we do, like the podcast, the magazine, our, our media outreach, we also co-sponsor what we call geology tours that we've been doing for many, many years. Uh, the latest one we have coming up June 2nd through 16, a passage from ice, Ireland to Iceland. Look at this beautiful, beautiful scenery here. And guess who's going? None other than Richard Dawkins, the author of, and here's his uh, memoir uh, that we sell, carry in our store. Richard is uh, a longtime good friend and also one of the most interesting, thoughtful, intelligent people I've ever met. It's incredible. I mean, I've met a lot of really smart, thoughtful people, and Richard, uh, I mean, he's just like on another level. It's truly astonishing. And on a cruise like this, you just hang out. You're just sitting there at breakfast or lunch or dinner. There he is. So go to skeptic.com, click on the the little ad, you'll see it pop right up on the homepage there for our geology tours, the next tour here available. All right, check it out. Thanks for listening. I have a special episode for you today on religion. Oh, this is epic. My guest is Lance Grande. He is the Nagani Distinguished Service Curator Emeritus of the Field Museum of Natural and Cultural History in Chicago. This is an epic place. He's a specialist in evolutionary systematics, paleontology and biology, who has a deep interest in the interdisciplinary applications of scientific method and philosophy. His many books include Curators, Behind the Scenes of Natural History Museums in 2017, and The Lost World of Fossil Lake, Snapshots from Deep Time in 2013. His new book, here it is, The Evolution of Religions, A History of Related Traditions. Look at this beast. This thing is like six, almost 700 pages long. I think, Lance, this thing weighs like 10 pounds. <laughs> it was hard to read. I was reading it by a pool, the pool yesterday. I was finishing up uh, at a fit little family vacation out at the desert, and this thing is like just resting on my lap. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a beast. <laughs> but you are to be commended. Thanks for coming on the show to talk to me about this. Well, it's a pleasure to talk with you today, Michael. I, uh, I have to tell you, well, I, you know, I have a, a massive library here, of thousands of volumes, and I have several cases of just a history of religion books and I've read them all. And yours is by far, I think, the best and most important I've read. And I don't say that lightly. There's a lot of really good works out there. Uh, but what I like about yours is that it's a, the, most of those are written by either you know, theologians or history, historians of religion. But you're coming at it from a scientist's perspective. It reminds me of Jared Diamond's work, particularly Guns, Germs, and Steel, but also his other works, Collapse and The Day Before Yesterday and so on. What Jared does, here's how I describe it. Historians will write a narrative, like A happened, then B happened, then C happened, and so on. And then Jared will write, well, A happened, then B happened, and then C happened. And now let's ask ourselves, why did it happen in that sequence and not some other sequence? And using the comparative method or uh, counterfactual reasoning, okay, let's look at another part of the world where C happened, then B happened, then A happened. Now, why did that happen that way instead of some other way? And so on and so on, so that you get some underlying structure and causality of why things turn out the way that they do. And I see something like that in your work. So let's just start off with how does a paleontologist and an evolutionary systematicist uh, end up ta tackling the history of religion? Well, you know, I, one of the things that's always fascinated me are uh, people who can use an interdisciplinary approach to science. That is, you know, I, I, had a, I have a PhD in biology, but I was hired by a geology department in a museum. And, you know, we have uh, anthropologists who pair up with the molecular lab there. And, and um, interdisciplinary work has always fascinated me. And uh, working in a major museum, you, you have an easier route to do that. Because, you know, if I was at a major university, I might have to trick clear across campus to uh, work with collections or facilities of other departments. But, you know, at the museum in Chicago, we're all in the same building, listening to each other's seminars and sometimes even collaborating with each other's research projects. Um, the collaborating aspect of it is something that has always um, fascinated me. And I, I think it's where a lot of major paradigm changes come from in science. Uh, you know, doing things in a somewhat different way from a, a discipline that's had a lot of experience doing them that way, uh, sometimes bringing that new way to a, a different aspect of, of science or historical studies um, results in uh, a major advance. Yeah, so your, your systematic approach 
you know, people, I think you quote somebody in the book about how complex human culture is, and therefore it's difficult to systematize. Well, the history of life, you know, I mean, there's like 10,000 religions in the last 10,000 years. Well, there's like 10 million species, and you guys somehow (laughs) managed, or maybe 100 million in the last, you know, 100 million years, something like that, and 99% of them went extinct. How do we know about these? Well, you guys have figured how to track their relationships, so it is possible. Yeah, well, there were there were, there were two separate histories going on in in these sciences, uh, um, the biological sciences versus the social sciences. Um, you know, in the in the nineteenth uh, century, um, when uh, evolutionary concepts first started to develop, um, they were a- a- adopted by many social sciences scientists right away. But it was in kind of a, a misappropriated form. Um, it was when evolution, some people were looking at evolution as this ladder of progress, uh, which in which you could identify, uh, say, some things being uh, um, advanced or better than others. Now, um, of course, for that reason, uh, things went in some bad directions in the social sciences, you know, leading to eugenics and other really bad things. Uh, and uh, one of the results was... Uh, the social sciences largely rejected not only evolutionism, but even comparativism for quite some time. Um, but in the biology, um, biological sciences, uh, the concept of evolution or the understanding and philosophy of it changed drastically. Um, you know, any kind of ladder-like um, concept pretty much disappeared. And instead, uh, evolutionary analysis became a search for relationships, that is, uh, looking for, you know, shared characters and other things that actually um, allowed you to make putative groups of things. And uh, that gave us a a deeper understanding of of the history of what we were looking for. Um, The social scientists are still coming around to this, this change. I mean, the linguists seem to have been the first ones to adapt to it, but some of the uh, aspects of of uh, cultural history still are are very resistant not only to evolutionism but even to comparativism. A uh, history of religion studies is one of them. Yeah, and is that because of this, this bad history that anything associated with biological evolutionary theory uh, has a taint of social Darwinism and survival of the fittest and and all that kind of Ernst Haeckel and and Herbert Spencer and and certain races are better than other races and, and all that stuff. And that makes social scientists post-World War II not want anything to do with it. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that's absolutely right. Um, y- you know, um, there is this, this feeling that I, I encountered within um, um, the cultural sciences of you should stay in your own lane. That, mm. you know, you shouldn't, it, you know, if you're studying... Um, Buddhism, for example, you shouldn't be writing about Christianity, or uh, if you're studying uh, Christianity, you shouldn't be writing about Hinduism. I mean, um, but the fact of the matter is, to get to the broadest uh, um, understanding of of anything, you really need some um, basis for comparison. I mean, you can't even understand things outside of your own lane, so to speak, unless you uh, look at them in some sort of comparative fashion. That doesn't mean it has to be a qualitative comparison. It's only a, a comparison to look for, well, what are these general or unique similarities that, that allow us to make these putative groups, and what does that tell us about their uh, uh, history of origin? Yeah. Yeah, Jared Diamond's a, a longtime good friend of mine, so I know uh, he's gotten a lot of the same kind of pushback where he's told, you know, you're a physiologist at UCLA studying <laughs> cellular structures. What are you doing writing about anthropology or, oh, or you know, oh, the yeah. history of civilization? He's like, well, I, I've gone to Papua New Guinea every year for 30 years, and I know <laughs> these, these, the Papua New Guineans there, and I, I've studied this. And it's like, no, but, but you're in this other lane over here. It's like, well, I'm going to do this anyway. Yeah, uh, I'm a he big ended up at, I'm, Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm a big. He fan ended up of in Jared's. the uh, geography <laughs> department at UCLA because Guns, mm-hmm. Jerks, and Steel won the Pulitzer Prize. So he used that as a. He didn't want to leave UCLA. He's got a beautiful home in the foothills there. 
but he he got an offer from Stanford, I think it was Stanford, to go to their geography department. So he took that to UCLA and said, all right, I'm leaving unless you let me teach what I want in the geography <laughs> department rather than the medical slash physiology department. So that's how he ended up there. But yeah, that's that's always a problem. I think that's true in all sciences and all fields. People are very territorial that way. But in reality, that is the only way to really, not the only way, but it's a, a good way to make progress by creatively bringing in new ideas from different fields. So, all right, one last thing on this kind of history of anthropology. We've tracked the anthropology wars at Skeptic for 30 years. You know, back in the 90s when Napoleon Shagdon got hammered for publishing that paper on the Yanomamo, uh, in which he took an evolutionary perspective and uh, and showed how the most aggressive males had more females and more, more wives, more children, and so on. And, you know, it, it was a, a more subtle argument than that, but, but boy, that just erupted into this whole kind of blank slate-ism in anthropology to the point where some departments were split, uh, in, like different buildings, the biological anthropologists and the cultural anthropologists, the latter being blank slaters. I don't know how much have you seen that in your career. Yeah, it, it's uh, um, it's really interesting um, how these conflicts have developed within the sciences, and I, I don't, comp I guess I should understand it because it seems to be part of human nature to to uh, become uh, conflicted about one thing or another. But uh, it it is it's it's troubling in some respects too. I think. Uh, it's something that we need to try and understand and, and get over. <laughs> yeah, and in, in the, uh, the Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, Pinker points out that the people that deny our ancestors were violent or aggressive, uh, deny it in a very aggressive way. <laughs> he called, I think he called them, or he was quoting somebody else, the, 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 the peace and harmony mafia. <laughs> They're very <laughs> aggressive <laughs> about defending that position. Anyway, that was kind of funny. <sighs> um, yeah. Okay. So let's let's go way back since you start you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago with the cognitive foundation of religion. Why would people you know cohere into religious groups? Why would they believe in God or the supernatural? What? Let's start in the brain. What what, what structures in the brain or neural networks or whatever are operating there? Well, you you need to at least have some way to. Um think in an abstract form, because um, if we're talking about um, supernatural belief systems, um, there's there's a component of that that requires you to be able to think in an abstract form. Um, and uh, in order to um, leave any kinds of uh, records, of course, you need to be able to uh, um, uh, either you uh, leave some sort of artifacts or some sort of communication. Again, all these things require some uh, levels of thought that um, are, you know, there's certainly levels above jellyfish. You know, you, you need to be able to think a certain way. Um, all uh, Eventually, uh, humans uh, come up with all kinds of different things, came up with all kinds of different things, uh, which basically allowed them to get to where they are today. Some of those things are good, some of those things are bad, but you know, the, the, the net effect is that we're still here. Yeah, so let's dive into that a little bit. There would be something like abstract thinking, like imagining, so the theory of mind, you know, I can imagine that you're imagining something, and I know that you know that I also know something, so there's common knowledge. I can I can abstractly picture into the future, you know, we're going to go do this thing and you go here and I'll go there, the hunt or whatever. And, you know, we project ourselves abstractly into the future. Um, and then, you know, it seems like things happen, maybe not randomly, but for some reason, the lightning storm or the accident or the termites caused the building to fall or whatever. There must be some hidden forces behind it. Because there are hidden forces, <laughs> you know, we, we know the laws of nature, <laughs> hidden forces. So, you know, early humans may have adopted this kind of what I call patternicity, finding meaningful patterns and random noise. Sometimes they are real or agenticity. They see, you know, our hyperactive agency. There's, there's secret, there's kind of intentional agency behind things happening. It, sometimes there are, sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. And we're not very good, uh, always good at finding causality. So would you start off with something like, gods or animism or wherever you want to start with that 
the trees are animated or they're alive. They are alive, but, but more than that, they have agency to them. Well, you know, again, this is all highly speculative because we're going back so far, but, um, you know, some sort of spiritualism must have been the first kind of component of this. I mean, whether it was an animistic one where you, you look at the weather, you look at the sun, you look at the moon and think all things have some sort of spiritual essence to them. Um, eventually, there may have been some anthropomorphization of these spirits where you might attribute some sort of human uh, characteristics to them. There may have been a development of gods and goddesses associated with all of these different elements. Um, there may have been um, imp things that are recognized as important to culture that entered into that, such as, say, uh, maternalism. I mean, that may have been the source of, uh, of ancient goddesses. We had these these things called Venus figurines, which are these carvings of uh, female entities that have emphasized the reproductive parts. Um, these things go back tens of thousands of years. And uh, you could see why something like this might have intuitively developed, because in really ancient clans where there were just small clans of people, um, the uh, uh, reproduction by the mothers would have been crucial to their survival, and an appreciation for that would have would have developed. Um, and uh, you know, it it was say sometime it it was a long time after that until there was an actual more developed civilization. Um, and I think it was when we had the development of things like armies and empires and all of that, that we slowly saw the emergence of a male-dominated uh, belief system over uh, um, a more general or a female-dominated one. Yes, I was just holding up while you were talking those uh, pictures of the Venuses and uh, this lion man, half lion, half man with uh, eyes that looks like it's staring, 40,000 years old, made of mammoth ivory. You know, how do we know what, why they did that? Well, we don't, <laughs> right? So there's a little bit of theory of mind going on ourselves. Like, what would I be thinking if I did that? Well, you live in the 21st century. You know, who knows right. what somebody was thinking 40,000 years ago. But on the other hand, there is something unique to that that no other species does. Uh, I mean, you have that picture of Congo the chimp <laughs> with its abstract <laughs> paintings. You know, these are right. hilarious. I think somebody sold, sold those, you know. Yeah, uh, but, but there's nothing. Of those. Yeah, yeah, but there's nothing like that of the Venuses or the Lion Man. So presumably, we could assume they must have been thinking in some abstract way, maybe in some animated or supernatural or spiritualist way of animals and humans and our place in nature, something like that. Yeah, uh, um, and uh, you know, it, admittedly, again, the farther back you go the uh, more um, hypothetical these, these things are. I mean, for example, some people object to uh, these Venus uh, sculptures as all being religious in nature. I mean, uh, some have even suggested they were pornographic. You know, it, it's hard to, hard to say what they were. It's like, you know, everything, when you're studying deep history, the further back in time you go, the more speculative um, your your uh, hypotheses are based on what you see um, in the social sciences is not unlike in the natural sciences. I mean, for example, in uh, evolutionary biology, um, the further back in time you go studying organisms, you're looking at fossils. And uh, as you go back farther and farther in time, when these fossils resemble modern organisms less and less, it gets more and more speculative about what you are looking at to the point of where you, you go back several hundred millions of years and you're looking at organisms where you can't even tell which was the front end and which was the back end. <laughs> right. The similar like things the, happen. Uh, the, those weird things at the Burgess Shale. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where they, exactly. They, they got them upside They were upside down in the original interpretations, right? <laughs> That's right. 
And it's really the same with archaeological archaeological um, artifacts. You know, you can you go way back in time, where you all you have are these these sculptures or these these scribblings on a wall, and that's very highly speculative. You come back, uh, you come up in time a little more, and uh, if you hit points like where we have writing systems where we can find contemporaneous written records by people of what they meant by these things, that gives us more information. Or you come all the way up to the modern age where you have video records of, of founders and things like that, and that's the best kind of information you have. Um, in that regard, it's easier to do the evolution of culture than it is to do the evolution of organisms, because one of the things you have with studying the evolution of culture are contemporaneous written records of founders and, and um, uh, branching events and all these kinds of things that uh, biologists would kill for. Because really, if you're looking for uh, examples of speciation, you're relying on fossils that are millions of years old. So they're way beyond any kind of contemporaneous uh, written records. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I held up this one here showing the little cross hatching on the whatever that is, clay or stone or rock or something like that. And That's a rock. Cave, <laughs> a rock, yeah. Uh, cave paintings. You know, I always, again, you wonder, well, did, did, was somebody meaning something by the hatch cross marks? Or is he just doodling? <laughs> just bored? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, That's you know, true. and the animals, the cave paintings, some of these are just uh, just magnificent art. Uh, you know, particularly when they're in kind of a bas relief, when there's a like a, a shape inside the cave and they use the shape as the hump of the ox or whatever um you know to me that seems deep i don't know what it means you know it's a hunting thing or magic or i don't know who knows uh but obviously there you know there's something abstract going on there and we don't know how old uh that went back in humans either because you know the oldest really um uh descriptive paintings we have made by humans are you know maybe ten thousand years um but they're generally done in caves and in, in regions, tropical regions, where these things will only last that long uh, before they they decay from the elements. And so, you know, they may have been making these things tens of thousands of years ago, but they're just simply not preserved. Again, it's much like fossil organisms. You know, when we find one, we're finding a minimum age it goes back to, but it could these these groups, these lineages, or these these belief systems could have gone back much farther than we have evidence for, which we just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I loved your section in the book about the people in the Americas, because I followed that debate for a long time. And, uh, and as, as Graham Hancock says, stuff keeps getting older. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, you know what? The, I think you have those footprints in the book that are, what, 23,000 years 20, old? 21,000 years old. 21,000 mm -hmm. New Mexico, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know that, that can't really be misinterpreted as as a rock that's not really a stone tool, but it accidentally chipped footprints or footprints. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And you you know, humans were in the old world a lot longer than they were in the new world. Um, I I know it's uh, something that that uh, most people understand, but uh, you know the things that go with that are. Uh, things like belief systems, uh, well, th their histories in the New World only go back that far. They only go back, you know, maybe twenty to 30,000 years, where, of course, in the Old World, they go back over 100,000 years, perhaps. So um, mm -hmm. geography yeah, the, has a lot to do with what you're, you're studying, too. Yeah, I'd love to come back centuries from now and find out, you know, w what we now know about X, whatever that is, like the people <laughs> in the, the Americas. There probably was multiple waves. It, you know, it's a pretty big continent. It's hard to miss. It's uh, true. You know, if somebody was moving back and forth hundreds of thousands of years ago by whatever means, I, I actually like the instead of walking over the the land bridge of, of what do they call it, the Kelp Highway, they just took boats down the coast. Yeah. I live here in I live here in Santa Barbara, so you know it's it's way easier to just take a boat somewhere <laughs> rather than walking. <laughs> but it did require a coast, and you needed the the land bridge for there to be a coast. So yeah, that's that. It's that's, all connected. That's that's right. And the other problem is, is the, the, uh, whatever, wherever they stayed along the coast is now 300 feet underwater. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So that, that d data is gone. <laughs> right.
Yeah. Okay, one more uh, on the ancient stuff here on Gobekli Tepe. Uh, again, another one of my favorite subjects here. This really is, it is phenomenal. I mean, talk about stuff keep getting older. I mean, it's supposedly monumental architecture required massive population, so you needed agricultural revolution, a government, a bureaucracy, division of labor, taxes, and all this stuff. And here, this was done, what, 9,130 BCE, so 11,100 years ago. You know, it's maybe, amazing. what, 6,000 years before the Egyptian pyramids, and or maybe even more. Uh, I mean, that's just astonishing. How did they do that? Especially since it predated agriculture. So, you know, you have people moving these blocks that weighed, you know, tons, which required, you know, organization of, of quite a few people. And, um, you know, what was holding them all together if, if they didn't have things like agriculture or, or government or who knows? I mean, it's, it's one of the mysteries, and I think uh, archaeologists are, are still trying to decipher it all. Yeah, well, maybe religion, right? I mean, that's one of the interpretations. I guess they didn't live there. Uh, they went there for whatever, ceremonial reasons, big party, <laughs> uh, yeah, or he, something. Um, you know, the T-shaped... totem pole. <laughs> yeah, like a totem pole, right, because those, mm -hmm. those T-shaped um, uh, stones that are like almost the size of Stonehenge-type stones have carved in them animals in bas-relief. I mean... It, it, <laughs> It's astonishing how you, you know, you carve down and then stop and then carve out a little animal and then keep carving straight. It's just how they could have imagined that. Obviously, these are fully human. Uh, but what were they thinking? Is this kind of a religion? And what would that mean? We're so in, in, ingrained, uh, inculturated into 20th century, 21st century religion and what that means. Or just say post-1500 religion. Um, I mean, it, it could be, who knows how, what they were That's thinking. Right. Could have been, you know, some sort of animistic thing. You know, uh, totemism looked like it uh, was probably present because they had, they did find an actual totem pole there. I mean, it was, uh, it would have been, a, it's one of those things that would be great to have a time machine to go back and see what was really going on there. Yeah, maybe it was some kind of a uh, way of organizing a group to be more pro-social, cooperative, reciprocal, altruistic. Uh, you know, defend our group against this other group, or you know, and maybe that is one of the roles of religion. So let's start with the definition of religion. How do you know? You must have encountered just endless definitions in your research, and what oh, did you man. end up? With? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's amazing. There's a lot of different definitions out there, ranging from just any form of supernaturalism to a, a lot of uh, people who speak uh, who pick a specific religion, uh, a particular particular branch of religion, like whether it be Christianity or Abrahamic monotheism or something, and defining religion that way. I mean, given you know, I, I am applying an agnostic approach here to not uh, have any sort of bias one way or another, um, I picked the most general definition, just supernatural belief systems. And I think in order to objectively do a broad comparison, you pretty much have to do that. Otherwise, you're subjecting your own bias into the, into the study. So, um, yeah, I um, figured... So believe, belief in some, some sort of supernatural entities, whatever those are, animism, spiritualism, polytheism, monotheism, it's all in that category. Right, but I, I certainly, though, emphasized organized religion, uh, because the records for those are so much better, and, and um, those are the the um, basically the religion, religions that have uh, certain rules and and traditions, and um, um, the the records we have for those are much better than say some of the more animistic uh, religions, uh, particularly in the regions, say, for example, of Africa prior to Islamic or Christian conquests, uh, there were pr probably thousands of different uh, um, belief systems there that we just know little or nothing about because um, um, one of the after effects of uh, conquest is uh, you not only change uh, the uh, culture's 
in in um, significant ways, but you also change the records of previous cultures. Um, you know, there are people who are are charged with writing down history, uh, uh, but they're generally um, writing it from the context of whatever their belief systems are or their understandings are. So it, it's complicated uh, when you're dealing with with uh, older systems that don't exist in an area anymore. Yeah, you have that picture of uh, some ancient, I think, Babylonian or Mesopotamian structures that the modern Islamists tore down. I can't find it now, but I remember when that happened, everybody was horrified. You know, didn't they, didn't they break into the museum uh, in Iraq and just destroy or steal all, all the artifacts? Yeah. And Yes, that's a powerful um, motivation for some religions for, uh, for whatever reason. It's not only to um, convert, but to even, um, destroy records of past cultures uh, hmm. for one reason or another. And um, I guess it's one way you, you um, try and uh, oh, proselytize. Yeah. Here it is. So this is now gone, I guess. That's now gone. That's the Lamas. Uh, yeah, that, is, that was completely destroyed. But it's not unlike what uh, also happened with... Uh, the conquests, uh, Christian conquests of, of the New World. Um, a lot of records were, were destroyed or, or rewritten in the context of uh, the conquerors. Um, it's just, historically, it's been something that uh, humans have done. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate because it limits our understanding of what went, went on before. I guess the problem is is, is that people want their particular religion to be true not they're not they're not looking at religion like you are or i would you know as an mm -hmm. interesting super diverse cultural phenomenon let's see if we can understand it it's that these other people believe these crazy ideas we got to pound that out of their heads and their cultures because we have the right one that's right and so often the particular belief systems pair themselves up with imperial powers or whatever other um, political system which is trying to dominate. There's a reciprocal benefit there because, of course, the, um, the particular belief system benefits from support from the imperial, imperial authority, and the emperor or the uh, caliphate head or whoever it is benefits from uh, endorsement from whatever the, the religion is. So it's an interesting... Um, motivator for history. Yeah. Well, let's think about this. As populations get larger, uh, uh, let's say you move from a few dozen to a few hundred and then a few thousand and then a few hundred thousand people, at some point you need to write down a codified set of rules. This is what, these are the good things, these are the bad things. You can't do mm -hmm. these, you have to do these, and so on, and give everybody a copy. <laughs> uh, you know, Jared, Jared talks about you know, the big man uh, uh, of the tribe and everybody gets together on Friday afternoon at the big square and they mm. hash out their differences. You can't do that if you live in a population of thousands of people. So you need something like government and something like religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was certainly true when uh, the population on the planet was um, maybe um, a couple hundred million people or, or less. Um, Part of the problem we have now is that we've got 8 billion people or more, and um, our, our, our culture is so different. We're, we are totally interconnected through technology. Um, we have all these building problems due to uh, uh, population growth, uh, ranging from um, you know, uh, regional poverty to um, pollution to uh, all kinds of things. and, and uh, that, you know, the tribalism that existed uh, earlier in our history that, you know, maybe uh, these rules helped um, our populations grow are becoming a maladaptive trait for our species. And uh, eventually, I think maybe um, 
contributing to uh, our eventual demise unless we figure out a better way to collectively address some of these issues <laughs> going forward. Yeah, we'll we'll hit that at the end of this conversation, your last chapter of the book. But but let's talk about the moral element. You know that again, governments give everybody a copy of the rules, and we have some police that are going to enforce the rules and courts and so on. But religion offers a, a, an additional shadow of enforcement. That is, even if you think you got away with it, there's an eye on the sky that sees all. Right. <laughs> and, and that has to be something of an internal police force inside people's heads. Well, that's true. I mean, it, you know, it's uh, when, when you have um, this notion that, you know, you're being watched by uh, either ancestors or supernatural um, elements that control your future or or something that um, is going to dictate what happens to you after you physically die. Um, that's Those are powerful motivators, and uh, especially when they are, um, as you say, uh, codified um, with a, a set of rules, and uh, there's a system worked out where, okay, if I do this, this good thing's going to happen. If I do this, this bad thing's going to happen. I mean, that that's a powerful influence. And, and historically, it obviously has been through time. Yeah, so already our thoughts about defining religion are getting complicated because you have social cohesion, moral enforcement, the rules, um, you know, kind of reinforcing reciprocal altruism, do the right thing. Uh, be careful of these bad things. What about those people over there? You know, they're a different tribe. They believe different than us. Political organization. You have, you have chief chiefdoms or or leader political leaders who something like divine right of kings, whatever they would have called it back then. Mm -hmm. That you know, my power is granted to me by the on high from the the, the greater gods. And and so on that so already it's getting complicated <laughs> in terms of like defining it. Oh yes, yes indeed. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's go through some of your your uh, tree structure here. Um, let's say roughly speaking, ten thousand different religions. Right now, about a third of those are uh, Christian, about a quarter Islam, another quarter Hinduism, Buddhism. Judaism is less than 1%, other 10%, agnosticism 10%, atheism 2%, right? So how did we get that level of diversity? How do you start to, to break it down? You go through um, these different um, uh, uh, kind of structures of uh, cyclical time versus linear time. Maybe start there, how people think of time is going to determine what kind of religion they think about or structure. Yeah, I, I look at it more in a systematic way that— um... Why, why do we have diversity of religion? Well, I think it's pretty much why we have the diversity of anything. It's, it's, it's kind of a law of physics or a law of nature. Uh, diversification over time is inevitable, and you can't prevent it. Um, it, it just happens. So um, nothing stays the same forever. Um, but the, um, the opposite of that is... That means if you follow things back in time, everything eventually converges. And so that's how we are able to construct things like these trees, where it gives us a broader historical context of what we're seeing when we see all this diversity today. I mean, why do we have 10,000 religions today and maybe another 100,000 that have come, become extinct over time? Well, it's because these things never stop diversifying, just like species of organisms never stop diversifying. It's just the law of nature, law of physics, um, law of entropy. Yeah, and yet Christianity and Islam today uh, account for over half of all human humanity. So the, well, the element the, there, is, I guess, conquest and uh, cultural influence and speed of travel and everything else that has kind of consolidated that. Well, you look at um, the uh, thing that did it for Christianity was pairing up with the Roman Empire, when the Roman Empire was basically the dominant Western power. Um, for uh, Islam, it was pairing up with the medieval caliphates. Um, all of these uh, different 
uh, um, most successful branches of religion had a history of pairing up with some of the most successful um, uh, political powers of their time. And um, I, that's, that is why we see certain branches, I think, so successful today. Now, there's a complicating factor there, too. Uh, also, um, when we talk about things like uh, Judaism, it's true, traditional Judaism only um, occupies uh, about 0.2% of the world population today, based on uh, studies uh, on the world database. But um, that's if you look at just traditional Judaism. If you use the word Judaism, if you're looking at things in a, um, a systematic evolutionary approach, it's much larger because even Christianity and Islam are, are branches of Judaism in a way because they were the fundamental beginnings of Abrahamic uh, monotheism. And again, things just continued to diversify from there. But if you look at things like um, the Tanakh uh, um, in uh, traditional Judaism, they were a source of information for the Old Testament or for the Quran or, or other things going forward. So, um, Religions like to emphasize their differences and uniquenesses. But if we're really interested in, interested in the broad history of these things, we have to be focused on what are the similarities that these different branches share, and what does that say about their deep history? So, yeah, it's, it's, you a, mean, uh, it's complex. Oh, right. So Judaism is really mon is Abrahamic monotheism so it's actually huge it, 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 i guess it, it it's sort of like you guys uh, talking about species are you a lumper or a splitter are you finding similarities are you finding That's differences right. there, there there's there's some subjectivity to it to a degree but also religion is such a controversial topic that there will be people who will scream and, and be incensed if you would try and call say christianity a branch of judaism or or on both sides of the issue, too. I mean, because, again, uh, one of the things that uh, fundamentalist um, branches of religion do is they want to emphasize their uniqueness, and they're not so interested in what they share in common with other groups. But again, if we're a historian trying to decipher broad history, we have to be focused on those shared characteristics uh, rather than the unique things, because the unique things don't tell us anything about historical relationship. It's only the shared characteristics that do. Yeah, I always find it interesting talking to uh, evangelical Christians and asking them about Mormonism. You know, oh, well, they're a crazy cult. Well, but, but they accept Jesus as their Savior. They just think there's Latter-day Saints. He wasn't the last. Well, still— <laughs> you know, they're completely different from us. Well, not completely. <laughs> There's actually a lot of similarities there, but oh no, they, they, and then they rattle off the kind of the, some of the goofier beliefs that they have. But of course that just depends on what you're used to, right? You know, you're just used That's to your right. story where the cracker and the wine become the blood and body of Christ and all that stuff. If you told this to somebody never heard of it, they'd think you're goofy. And, and a lot of branches use various techniques to, to emphasize their uniqueness. For example, if you look at Jainism, the Jains, some Jains try to contend that Jainism goes back trillions of years. Why? Well, because then who predates that? Um, it is uh, it's something that's really important to a lot of uh, fundamentalists, that they were the source of all others. And, um, it, you know, it, you can't really argue with people about that, um, all you can do is um, show, show what, what you find out by looking at some sort of um, data, something that's based on something other than pure belief. Yeah, the, the thing with 
older religions is that they're lost in the mists of time and their origin stories are, you know, really hard to verify or, or check. But if you have something like Scientology, it's like, well, we have L. Ron Hubbard's writings of the 1940s and 50s when he was writing science fiction with the other side. We know where these stories came from. So we know that's right. a bunch of baloney, you know, but, and then Joseph Smith, you go back, you know, 200 years, uh, okay. And then, you know, Christianity, 2000 years, Judaism, 3000. Okay. But it's so far ago, long ago that it's like, well, okay. Something special happened way back when, who knows exactly what it was. <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to barrage anybody for their belief systems. I, people can believe what any they want, anything they want, as long as it doesn't cause, uh, you know, some egregious harm to somebody else. Um, but Again, I, what I choose is, again, to look for this, this broader, um, broader conception of all of these things, because I'm, I'm a historian. I'm interested in finding out what do the facts tell me actually happened, not the beliefs, but the actual facts. And if I'm looking at the evolution of ideologies, then I have to look at what were the sources of these ideologies that I can demonstrate based on either archaeology or some sort of, of written observations. And, um, you know, you know that, that's where I'm going with this. Oh, I think it's the right way to go, for sure. And uh, the, another thing I've been trying out is different kinds of truths. And, you know, if you compare religion to science as a tool of empirical testing of claims about nature or the past, that's not going to be very productive for your religious beliefs. But if you think of religious sto stories as literature, like art, it, like poetry, mm -hmm. it's music, it's a different kind of truth. It's telling us something about the human condition, you know, like, uh, uh, the, the, you know, Merchants of Venice and Shakespeare has Shylock you know, complaining, am I not a man? If you prick me, do I not bleed? But okay, this is a completely made up story, but, but, but it, but it has a different kind of deeper truth. So mm -hmm. why not treat the resurrection or whatever your, your particular religious story is, as like a literary truth. But today that, when I present that to believers, that doesn't really fly. They, they want it to be actually true. And I wonder if that's because that's the world we live in, the age of science. It's got to be actually true, not just some, you believe one thing and I believe something different and we can all get along. Well, yeah, that's one way of looking at it. But another is that science is always searching for truth, but never profess to really have it. I mean, if I've come up with a hypothesis about um, a how a group of organisms uh, are interrelated or how a group of, uh, say, religions are interrelated, I don't profess to be showing the truth. I'm showing a hypothesis that I open up for future people to um, test, falsify, and improve. And that's part of science is we are not trying to create the final word. We are trying to advance our understanding of things. And that's why science is always changing. Um, we have certain theories that we often use to guide us in, in, in uh, forming hypotheses, specific hypotheses, but we don't expect those hypotheses to remain unchangeable and unchallengeable over time. And that's one of the things that separates science from a lot of belief systems, because some fundamentalist belief systems are not open to challenge. That is, this is the way it is, and it cannot be any other way. And if you choose not to believe that, then you are a heretic. Um, and, and what would be the reason for that? Is that it leads to more social cohesion or people are more likely to obey the rules or be nice or whatever for the group? I think tribalism is some ingrained aspect of human um, psyche that uh, has to be recognized and then hopefully. Uh, circumvented uh, um, in a way that uh, allows us to improve our, our situation. I mean, if we are, are going to be um, subject to our environment, uh, just like all species are, whether that environment is physical or social, we need to be able to 
constantly be able to adapt to that environment, whatever it is at any given point in time. And as that environment changes, we have to make some changes too. And if there was a period when tribalism wasn't beneficial to us, okay, well, that might be possible. Uh, but if we're entering a period where it is now detrimental to us, that's something we have to come to grips with. And uh, that's one of the things, that's one of the ideas I was hoping to uh, propagate here. Yeah. Well, so maybe you would in in endorse something like Stephen Jay Gould's NOMA principle, non-overlapping magisteria, science and religion are just, they're doing completely different things. They are. And uh, I mean, I, so I'm not professing a religion. I'm simply trying to uh, look at the ideolo ideological variants out there and trying to see how they're interrelated to each other. So I'm not being judgmental on these things. I'm just trying to e e evaluate them in a comparative way uh, that leads me to um, better understand their histories. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay, the punishment of dissenters and heretics, especially if it's a, what is it, a lapsed heretic? You know, once a true believer, then fallen away. Why would the punishment need to be harsher for those people? Is it because they don't want the current believers to go down that path? Well, that that's certainly one good uh, reason for it. I mean, you know, they're traitors to the cause. Um, maybe they endanger the the um, cohesiveness of it all. Um, but they're also inevitable because, again, that's part of what seeds the diversification over time. I mean, all these diverse branches, they come from people who diverge from what the, the fundamentalist view was before them. Yeah. Well, it's a little bit like the group selection versus the individual target of selection in evolutionary theory. And that one theory of religion is that it was like a, it could be explained by group selection, that groups that were more cohesively held together by religious beliefs are more likely to survive in groups that were more individualistic or something like that. Yeah, that, that's certainly one theory. Um, whether it was the religion or the fact that um, the religion was paired with a social structure that allowed uh, more communal um, um, advantages, you know, armies and agriculture and all that, it, you know, it's hard to say which one or the other was responsible for that, but... Uh, um, uh, but all those things probably contributed to the success of, of certain societies. I mean, religions are just massively successful. It'd be hard to find something more successful in the history of humanity than religion. So it must have served some really useful adaptive purpose. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, religion uh, actually um, had a remarkable number of benefits to the growth of human society. I mean, you know... Um, their contributions to uh, early art, uh, um, you know, the, the earliest um, uh, centers of higher education or the earliest uh, um, uh, medical organizations. These are all based in uh, religious entities originally. Now, they diversified beyond that, but, um, you know, uh, uh, religion, the idea of religion... Uh, came with a lot of benefits to human society. Um, but uh, human society is a lot different now than it was um, 100,000 years ago or even 1,000 years ago. So, you know, it's hard to, hard to say where we're going at this point, but it's obvious that some things we need to change because we are in such a different social environment nowadays than, than we used to be. Yeah. All right. So we got politics, we got morality, we got social cohesion, music and art and so on, um, driven by religion. What about the belief in the afterlife? What role has that played in the history of religion? You know, that it's, it's addressed one of the fundamental questions that humans have had, you know, uh, what happens to me when I die? You know, where do I go? after this, or do I go anywhere? And, um, you know, that's a question that didn't really uh, bother the ancient Romans much, you know. A lot of the ancient Romans were basically satisfied with, okay, I'm here now, 
when I'm gone, I'm gone. And, and that was pretty much it. And to them, religion was mostly looking for help in the present life. You know, we, we want we want more rain. We want successful crops. We want our armies to be victorious. Um, but eventually, um, the uh, human quest for uh, something beyond an afterlife or these sorts of things um, increased within society. And uh, that became uh, a major motivator for a lot of the most uh, powerful religions today. And uh, probably one of the reasons why they became so victorious over polytheism in the ancient Romans, for example, where um, um, monotheism, uh, with its um, promise of an afterlife, uh, seemed advantageous to people that, okay, well, if I believe in, uh, you know, Zeus, um, I'm not going anywhere after this, but, um, you know, if I, if I um, believe in, um, say, uh, Christianity, um, there's a chance that I'll live forever in, in a wonderful place. Um, and uh, that, w- that was a powerful attractor. Uh, it was something that eventually pulled the entire Roman Empire over to Christianity. And, um, you know, by the fourth century, it was actually um, made the state religion of, of the Roman Empire. So it was a huge change, but it was, again, partly because I think this powerful draw uh, to an afterlife. Yeah. If I recall, the Jews did, originally did not have belief in an afterlife, right? Yeah, well, that goes back quite a ways. Uh, um, um, I, the what you would call even traditional Jews, uh, monotheistic Jews today, but they were pretty much a, um, thinking about an afterlife, a, a one form or another, and um, that of course uh, developed with time. And and um, after the afterlife was a big, um, big uh, inducement to uh, Abrahamic. Um, monotheism, for sure. In terms of a, a reward for a life well lived, and or don't forget to do the right thing because there's going to be a cosmic courthouse afterwards that uh, assesses everything you did, something like that. <laughs> That's true, but of course, this is this is also true in a d- different form, in with uh, what I call Asian cyclicism, where um, you know things like Buddhism and Hinduism, um, maybe you're afterlife comes in the form of another life, uh, you know, or reaching a, 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 um, a nirvana of sorts. I mean, there are different ways that people look at uh, what happens after I die here in a religious context. And, uh, but, uh, but you're right, and I think that is a powerful motivator for people in the here and now who have a religious belief. Yeah, I love that discussion of psych- cyclism. And you know, so time's arrow, time cycle, I guess, would be the way to distinguish Eastern versus Western religions. I guess for Western religions, it's not repeating itself. It's just that there's another stage on the linear scale right. after this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's an arrow. Like you say, it's a, it's, a, it's a linear system, whereas in a lot of the major uh, Asian, um, indigenous Asian religions, it's a cyclic process. Um, and, uh, you know, it shows the uh, uh, early division between the cultures, uh, Eastern and Western cultures. And uh, it, it still exists today, although there are certain influences, cross-influences. Um, you know, certain elements of Asian cyclicism have, have uh, influenced elements of linear monotheism and vice versa in certain, certain through, sub-branches. Through what, just cultural diffusion or, or through conquest? Yeah, it's cultural diffusion. Um, you know, um, it only takes one person to develop an ideology into a different place, and somebody there who's who's the next um, a prophet of a new branch might incorporate some of the ideas he learned from that person coming into their their culture. So um, that's part of of how things evolve. I mean, the the uh, the equivalent of genes in biological evolution are what some people call memes uh, in ideological evolution, and um, these are things that seed these new these new branches uh, going wherever they're going to go. Yeah, another of these debates I'm interested in is is this cultural diffusion 
um, through travel or whatever conquest versus simultaneous or similar inventions. You know, why are there pyramids in South America and there's pyramids in Egypt? Did the Egyptians sail over to South America or are there only so many ways to structure a building? And that just is a logical one. It makes sense. Yeah. I mean, like the pyramid example, that could be an example of what we would call parallelism in the biological sciences. I mean, we have insects that fly and we have birds that fly and we have mammals that fly. Um, there's no such a monophyletic group as think animals that fly. Um, flight was evolved independently in those three lineages. Um, and uh, it, it was just a general enough characteristic where it was bound to develop more than once. And uh, your example of pyramids is probably a similar uh, example. Yeah, in, in the same way that, uh, let's say, you have flood myths, cultures that develop on mm -hmm. large bodies of water that flood are more likely to have similar stories about floods. Exactly. All the, all the earliest civilizations were built in floodplains, so it's not unreasonable to, to think that they would all have these, these flood stories uh, um, because, you know, a thousand-year flood uh, in an ancient culture would have been like the end of the world. Why the, then, say, resurrection stories or virgin birth stories? What, what, what similarities are there there? What, what would those stories serve? What purpose? I think they all serve to make an event more special. What makes this something that is really worth uh, some sort of supernatural influence rather than just being uh, a random chance? Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's much more impressive to say, ah, uh, this person was born a virgin birth, uh, which will make somebody think, well, how's that even possible? Well, it must have been something beyond our knowledge of, you know, physical uh, possibilities. Um, uh, you know, the miracles, I mean, are the same thing, you know, I mean, and miracles are often added as time goes on, you know, the the original um, apostles, for example, in Christianity, I really didn't talk about miracles. Um, um, these things were added to um, biblical references well after the the death of of the, the supposed death of of Christ, um, and I think they're added as embellishments to to make. Um, make these stories even more wonderful than they are to begin with. And again, it's, I think it's a, a, natural, um, a natural trait of humans to, to embellish things they like and to yeah. demonize things they don't like. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, for sure. All right, let's talk about the transition from polytheism to monotheism. Why is that considered progress in religion? Or why, why is monotheism considered better than polytheism? in the mind of the believer anyway. Well, again, in the believer, it goes back to um, that polytheism was, you could say, more short-sighted in that respect because it only dealt with the um, here and now, for the most part. Um, after people died, the afterlife for them was no picnic, if anything at all. I mean, if, if you were royalty, some of them... Uh, uh, were promised that they would be, uh, um, you know, coming it up with the gods, but that was not the the main um, outcome for most people. For most people, uh, it was basically uh, an existence of eternal boredom or just the end. Period. And uh, so, when um, monotheism came along with a promise of an afterlife. That was a huge thing, uh, um, and that attracted a lot of people to it. Um, now, you add to that that um, uh, once people did convert uh, to something like that, they rarely went back to polytheism, and so it was kind of a, for culturally, a one-way street. And uh, eventually, of course, emperors realized that, you know, there in terms of pairing with um, the belief system at the time, 
if there was only one God, and I could be on a, um, say, one-to-one uh, -one basis with the one God, that gave me a lot more power than simply being another member of a pantheon that involved hundreds or even thousands of gods. And so uh, there was a, a benefit even to uh, imperial uh, um, organizations uh, that way. Um, similarly, um, uh, other uh, leaders of, of, you know, caliphates or, or whatever the systems were for rule, uh, um, pairing up with um, a single, or at least a, a, a a single god and maybe a single prophet um, was very advantageous. Uh, it gave more power to that person. Yeah, I remember one of Bart Ehrman's books talking about the uh, pre origins of Christianity. The idea of gods coming down to earth to have sex with uh, mortals, humans, was not that uncommon. This happened all the time. No. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. How that works, who knows? But they didn't really know much biology at the time, anyway. <laughs> That's true, and even these even these uh, religions themselves just completely change profoundly um, during their existence. Um, you know, all you have to do is look at uh, um, early Abrahamic religion, early Christianity, early Islam, and compare it to how it's diverged and changed over time. And uh, again, once again, it's. Uh, uh, divergence over time is just an inevitable uh, property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do wonder if some of these religions that are so big now grew that large because they really were better as an adaptation, social adaptation really made groups more cohesive or whatever. Or was it just random? It's just contingent, just, you know, that the emperor of Rome you know, fell down on the bridge and the battle went well and he promised God he would adopt Christianity if he won and he did. Oh, lucky lucky Christians. <laughs> Could have gone the other way. And there was probably elements of both. I mean, it was probably mm -hmm. a combination but it certainly um, it, it certainly involves some something of both of those things, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. You know, in the Jewish rite of circumcision, I, if I recall the Christian said you don't have to be circumcised <laughs> which, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of guys right, are going to yeah. go, well, in that case, I, 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 I wasn't going to join, but now I will. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, who knows what motivates people, but and yeah. who knows what motivates cultures sometimes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it was Ehrman who did the, the calculations. No, it was somebody else. It was Rodney Stark, I think, the calculations of what kind of growth you need for Christianity to go from like 50,000 people to 2 billion. You know, it's like 0.01% growth a year for you know, 2,000 years, and you that's what you get, it's like compound interest. Right. And it helps to have that irreversible thing, too. I mean, the, the fact that if you're going from something like polytheism to uh, Christianity, um, when you have, it, it's basically a one-way um, street. I mean, you don't have a lot of uh, early Christians going back to polytheism, but um, you have a lot of polytheists going to Christianity. So... Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Why would that be? Because it's simpler, more effective? And again, it tends to be um, something that, you know, if if you're Christian, uh, you hand that down to your family. And uh, of the uh, attractor, again, of the afterlife and um, um, various other things, just, it's a much better um, attractor than say, okay, well, we'll give you rain uh, for your crops for the next few years, but when you're dead, you're dead, and that's it. Mm. Wasn't there something of a transition like that in ancient Egypt where originally the pharaohs were the ones that have eternal life, but then eventually the people working on the pyramids were also, if they worshipped the pharaoh, they would get eternal life also? Yes, although it wasn't quite as good. And, uh, oh, you know, you, oh. had, you had all these, <laughs> uh, you know... Um, of course, the the ruling entities also always receive the best uh, um, uh, benefits of the afterlife, and uh, again, that was probably because of the um, synchronicity between religion and uh, the uh, ruling entities. Yeah, that reminds me of this. Sorry, this picture of this 
ancient. Uh, what that's a hundred thousand years. Is that a hundred thousand years old? Of of a um, is that a Neanderthal? I forget now. That's, uh, I think it's yeah, Homo sapiens. Sanger archaeological site in Russia, twenty six thousand BCE. Twenty thousand, yeah, twenty six thousand. Adorned skeletal remains with thousands of ivory beads. Why would you bury yeah. somebody? They they must have had some concept in their head. He's off to this other place now, and we're going to send him off with these grave goods. Yeah, that that it must have been the case. I mean, you, why else would somebody spend that much time and um, resources for somebody they were putting under the ground? Uh, um, there there must have been something going on there. But again, because it's so ancient and uh, well before any kind of written records, uh, much of that is highly speculative. It has to be. Yeah, it's like that other site with the flowers, the uh, seeds of flowers, fossilized flowers. And uh, so, well, they well, they buried their dead with flowers. Well, maybe, or maybe the body just stank and they threw flowers in there <laughs> and then covered it up with dirt, you know, something like that. I don't know. Um, yeah, again, it's hard to say. Part of the problem, I think, with the afterlife is that we can't conceive of not continuing, not being sentient anymore. If you ask people, what's it like to be dead? You know, people, well, I imagine my, there I am in my, the casket and my family and friends are there and they feel really bad, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. But of course you're picturing something because you're a sentient conscious being answering my question. If you're dead, you're, you're not thinking of anything. Uh, right. So it's literally impossible to imagine not existing. Uh, and, yeah. and from there, then, you know, we're natural born dualists, as Paul Bloom calls us. And, you know, from a very early age, we imagine the mind is this reified thing that floats around. And after you're dead, it floats off the brain and into the wherever it goes, the quantum ether or something. <laughs> uh, and it just continues you know, mm -hmm. because I just can't picture anything else. And it's like, imagine nothing. You know, why is there, why is there something rather than nothing? How how could you even imagine nothing? Because you have to start by eliminating all the physical stuff, and then all energy, mm -hmm. and then all space and time, and not only that, but you'd have to you'd have to eliminate all the laws of nature, in, and logic, mathematics, all Platonic ideas, and including gods and God. The, mm -hmm. None of that could at some point, you know, there's no, uh, it, it, there's not even eternity because there's nothing. <laughs> there's just, and I don't even at this point I don't even know what the words mean anymore. Yeah, and uh, I mean, who knows what happens? I mean, I'm not trying to disparage anybody and, and their particular belief system, but um, we have to admittedly uh, um, say that we just have no idea. Uh, um, you know, we can adopt a belief, but we don't know what happens after we die. And, um, you know, who's to say? Yeah. Well, my answer is, yeah, uh, nobody knows, but just in case, why not make this world a better place? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 because we live here and now, not in the we afterlife. Did. This, I actually think, I, I wrote a, writing about this in my next book, uh, that maybe this is what Jesus meant when he said, the kingdom if, of God is within you. You know, because it, 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 he has some passage like people say, lo, it's there, or lo, it's over here. No, it's not, it's not anywhere. It's inside you. Oh, <laughs> I go for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's talk about the origins of monotheism. You call it linear monotheism, Atonism, Zoroastrianism, and then mm -hmm. El and Yahweh and Jehovah. And here we are with Christianity, Islam mm -hmm. and Judaism. What is the, what's the earliest origins we know about that? Well, there's Aten uh, and Atonism. Aten, Aten was a, a pharaoh and um, he, uh, um, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, pharaoh was uh, um, Akhenaten, who uh, was also, as pharaoh, um, an authority on the uh, religion, and he promoted Aten, one of the um, uh, deities in the uh, pantheon, to being the sole and only god, which was one of the earliest uh, records of, uh, of monotheism that we know of. And um, this was an when, early experiment. When is that? Oh, that is. Um, I'll yeah, look it up in this book. <laughs> look it up in the book. <laughs> Atonism. Yes, let's see. That, so that would have been 
like a thousand years before. Oh Judaism, yes, it's, it's probably. It, yes, it's or much more. earlier. Uh, two sixty. All right, let's look it up. Here we go. Two sixty. Here we go. Uh, right. Atonism. Well, fourteenth uh, century BCE. Zoroastrianism. Twelfth century BCE. Oh, yeah, there's a 14th century BCE, right? Okay. 14th century BCE, right? And and um, so it was it was the earliest form, but it didn't last very long because, uh, um, you know, he by by promoting Aten, um, Akhenaten offended the um, priests, high priests of the time, and um, of course um, he made himself the primary contact with the god and um the uh his wife was also another primary contact and when um he died atonism basically disappeared it went back because the uh old priests basically um reasserted their dominance here and uh they brought uh, uh polytheism back and so uh, monotheism saw a dry spell there again and, until um, we saw the rise of Zoroastrianism. And uh, that was another uh, uh, attempt which actually stuck this time. It was prior to Abrahamic monotheism, but uh, um, Zoroaster uh, uh, promoted another form of uh, monotheism. And um, it uh, lasted and uh, at some of it actually uh, shows its influence on the rise of later Abrahamic monotheism, too, because, again, some elements of the Old Testament um, are somewhat reminiscent of some of the uh, uh, parts of Zoroastrianism. Uh, for example, these, the three wise men mentioned in the Old Testament are, are thought to possibly have been Zoroastrian um, in uh, origin. Um, there were um, some people who speculate that Abraham himself might have been an Zoroastrian priest at one point. Um, there are all these highly speculative uh, connections, but again, they go back so far in time that they are highly speculative, and, and uh, there's no way of knowing for sure. Yeah, okay, you write here, Atonism is formalized at a monotheistic religion when Akhenaten becomes sole ruler of Egypt and declares Aten to be the one and only God. Do we know why he did that? I think he saw the benefit, again, in um, creating not only a one and only God, but then his special, unique relationship with this one and only God. It gave him much more power, and um, um, he himself then became uh, somewhat who was uh, a somewhat deified in this process. Yeah, you talk about here the Yahweh alone movement, true Abrahamic monotheism named after Abraham, the patriarch of the Israelites, develops from the Yahweh alone movement, elevating Yahweh from chief God of the Israelite pantheon to the one and only God. So again, there must have been something like an, uh, an adaptive advantage to simplified uh, form of, of a religious structure like that. You know what is monotheistic dualism, and and why is that? Why why did that take off over what 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 came before it? Zoroastrianism was a it was kind of the road to Abrahamic monotheism in in some sense. Uh, once we get to uh, Abrahamism, uh, we're starting with something that's basically including uh, a number of different gods still. Uh, but when we get to Abrahamic monotheism. Now we're, we're entering the Yahweh alone movement, where we have this single uh, Abrahamic God, Yahweh, uh, also known by several other names. But basically, this tends to uh, uh, simplify the hierarchy here, that we're not worried about all these different uh, deities any longer. We have one God, and all of our attention for worship uh, points to this one single God. Right. 
Right. The major branches of Abrahamic monotheism share a number of important patriarchs, including three particularly prominent early figures uh, discussed later in the chapter, Noah, Abraham, and Moses. So why is that important to a religion to have, I don't know what you call those prophets or major figures like that? Well, it's interesting to have a, a robust story for anything that you're trying to encase in perpetuity. Um, and having all of these prophets was very important. Um, um, I picked these three in particular because they're important to all the major Abrahamic religions today. They're, they're certainly part of, of uh, traditional Judaism, a, a part of uh, Christ, Christianity, and part of Islam. Um, they are some of the uh, major prophets leading up to Abraham. So um, uh, you need this kind of lore, I think, to give people something that they can study and, and um, um, build their own familiarity around um, people of importance that they can select and, and use for lessons in how they uh, live their life. Yeah, let's talk about the lesson of the Genesis flood story. The great flood story of Noah appears to have inherited many of its details from polytheistic flood stories predating Abrahamic monotheism, such as the Mesopotamic Epic of Gilgamesh, which you have a whole other section on, but I, I love that story. So t tell us about what's that story and how is it different and similar to the Noachian flood story? Well, it's interesting because so many there are so many parallels. I mean, Gilgamesh was was uh, warned that there was going to be a great flood and and uh, to build an ark. And in fact, the instructions he received to build this ark were very similar to the instructions that um, Noah received to build his ark. And so, uh, um, many uh, historians speculate that the uh, story of Noah and his ark. Uh, drew from the earlier story of uh, Gilgamesh. Yeah, and but but what's the meaning of the story? Why what 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 would people get out of this? Well, um, one of the things people might get out of it is the gods. Uh, the god has um, god or gods have powerful recourse if human society varies from where. Uh, the deity intends it to go. I mean, if if the world uh, becomes sinful and and um, disrespective of the gods or God, um, he can basically wipe it out and start from scratch again. And that's that's what happened with Gilgamesh, and uh, that's what happened with Noah. I mean, the similarities are um, amazing in these two, and it must they, they... hinge on. Yeah, they seem too similar to just be parallelism. Like maybe there's a right. common source for both oh, of them, or the one gave rise to the other. The Gilgamesh story is older than the Noachian flood story, right? It is much older. So I, I, I believe that the, um, the Noah story must have drawn on these earlier myths and um, fleshed them out in a, in a different way. All right, here's another one to ask about. Uh, you have a, the, the famous Rembrandt painting of... Abraham about to sacrifice his son Isaac until his hand is is stayed by the angel who was the angel one of El's angels um, to stop him from you know so why would God ask you to kill your own kid I mean you know when you just hear the story out of context if I heard the story I'd, I'd say no I'm not killing my kid I don't care who you are or how powerful you are I'm not doing that but obviously this serves some completely different purpose I think it just shows just how old some of these ideas were, because again, yeah, one of the things that modern Christians uh, um, look back at at um, older polytheistic religions and, and um, basically uh, comment on how horrible they were is is the what they uh, see as the human sacrifice aspect of it. But vestiges of this actually carry through even in to the early Abrahamic uh, traditions, because we have, for example, that story of Abraham ready to sacrifice his only son. So the human sacrifice is only gradually phased out of these, these religions as time goes on. 
Yeah, you said that in a way, of course, to echo that God gave his only begotten son so that you may have that's, eternal life, John 3, 16, right? That's, the, that's, that's right. the echo of that. Even Christianity itself is based on God sacrificing his only son. And, and so the, the element of, uh, of uh, human sacrifice um, perpetuated itself to some degree in early Abrahamic uh, monotheism. I also wonder if sometimes at play here is costly signaling theory. That is, the, the, the crazier the story or the more outlandish the story, God asked you to kill your own kid? I'm, I am so devoted to this faith, I, I believe that story. I would do that. That's how dedicated I am. Now, that, that you don't actually do it is sort of beside the point. Yeah, that's, that's one of the dangers, I think. Uh, um, that's where sometimes uh, religion becomes uh, detrimental. That is, if we believe that um, it's our religious duty to kill somebody else or to um, um, go on a conquest to wipe out a, a, another people or to um, um, sacrifice one's son or daughter. Um, uh, and these are all concepts that are uh, detrimental to our, our own good. Yeah. Yeah. So you write here that uh, Moses, like Abraham, is said to have come from a background of polytheism. Some passages in the Old Testament indicate that he had polytheistic beliefs even after escaping Egyptian slavery. In Exodus fifteen eleven, he asks Yahweh, who among the gods is like you, Lord? He later says, now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated uh, Israel arrogantly. Right, so even in the Ten Commandments, um, you, you know, his, his, you shall have no other gods before me and, and, you know, worshiping idols. So in a way, he's saying there's other gods, but I'm the main one, or I'm the only real god, or something like that, almost acknowledging polytheism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Moses, by the way, was not known as a particularly kind person. I mean, yeah. he, he um, let's say some of the things he did might have been interpreted as, as um, uh, war crimes today. But um, Oh, yeah, there's that story where, <laughs> the, where they come back from battle and he said, what, what do you mean you didn't kill all the virgins and the children? Get back out <laughs> there and clean up. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, he and was again, a war, warlord. And again, I, I, you know, that's not to, to um, I, it's not meaning to insult people with specific beliefs, but there are good parts and bad parts to all these different beliefs. And I think it's up to people to, to distinguish those good parts from those parts that are really detrimental to yeah. our society. W right. Well, but the story, okay, the stories are probably not even true, most of them. Probably like the Iliad and the Odyssey. They're just stories. But they right. do reflect what life was like at the time. I mean, it was mostly these badass warlords fighting over women and territory. And that's, that's the true. way life was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And no question. I mean, it, you know, so life the, is you tough know, in those days. You know, when, when uh, persnickety atheists like me asks, you know, why isn't there something prohibiting slavery <laughs> or, you know, sex abuse in the Bible? The, you know, God, God couldn't even get that one right. Well, you know, I'm missing the point of, you know, what life was like at the time. And, you know, these rules about how to treat your slaves. Well, that was actually an improvement over the way slaves were being treated. Everybody had slaves. So really it's, you know, kind of putting it into context. Culture, culture changes as, as a, a homogeneous, homogeneous entity. But along with that, the various aspects of culture also change. And, um, that that's history. That's... All right. Who wrote the Bible? Okay. Here's what you write. Many Jewish and Christian believers ascribed the original authorship of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament of the Christian Bible to Moses in the 13th century BCE. However, modern biblical historians believe it to have been composed by multiple authors between the 9th and 5th century BCE. The five books include Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Originally, transmission of the volumes was oral, dependent on the passed down memories of oral transmissionists over many generations with no written version until centuries later. All right, so pick up the story there. What do we know about that? 
Yeah, I mean, that's who wrote the Bible. That's one of those unanswerable questions because <laughs> it, it happened before uh, the, the people try to say that it was written uh, in preliterate times and was carried along by oral transmission. That's, that's highly speculative because, again, the only way we know that happened was through oral transmission. So it wasn't contemporaneous. Uh, the records aren't contemporaneous because the first oral transmissions to be written down were well after um, what people claim were the earliest um, writings or the earliest uh, um, transmissions of this. The further back, you, as, as you said before, the further back in time you go, the more speculative historical reconstructions are. And that's also true for uh, trying to uh, dis decipher when things like the Bible were first written. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the New Testament. You know, it's the whole Bible is kind of a wiki, right? Lots of people it's, making it's lots true. of contributions and editing over time and so on. And at some point, what's that, was that fourth century? Uh, that, you know, the, the church father sat down and said, all right, these are the official books of the Bible, and that's it. We're not adding any more or taking any more out. All right. Yeah, when was that? Was That was like 4th, 5th century, something like that, when it kind of kind of got solidified. And the, and the, the way we record history it cha has changed so profoundly. The, mm. the farther back you go, the more speculative this is, and we're getting into territory uh, once we we go back before uh, writing, where we're dependent on oral transmissions. Um, even that uh, became more problematic the further back you go, because um, the earliest oral transmissions were just you know somebody in the clan or somebody in in the village talking to somebody else. And it wasn't until many gener generations of that that uh, they began to train professional oral transmissionists, which uh, provided, say, one more degree of of uh, of uh, um, uh, adherency to it. Um, but it wasn't until we started writing things down that we had um, um, some sort of literacy that we had any kind of consistent way of, of looking at, at history. I mean, you can imagine even with professional transmissionists, you know, anyone who's ever played the game of telephone knows that every time you go from one person to another, there are little changes that happen, uh, whether you want it to or not. And um, the one nice thing about uh, writing it down is it provides a sense of consistency, assuming you can actually preserve those early writings. Um, once we get to a printing press, then you have a a consistent way of writing things down, which adds a, a even greater element of consistency. And then, of course, eventually you get into things like videotaping and and all this, and it just increases even more. And and even even more so, the idea of history as an accurate rendering of what actually happened is a fairly new concept it's like maybe 19th century you know before that histories were really just well written by the winners or they they carry some symbolic meaning or they're declaring some other kind of truth but not an mm -hmm. empirically accurate rendering of what actually happened yeah, absolutely yeah so you know why did they write the gospels or the old testament or whatever well authors had their own motives but you know we think of it like well this must be an accurate rendering of the life of Jesus. No, that, that wasn't the point of why they were writing those stories. Yeah, well, that's partly because Christianity was one of our first major proselytic uh, religions. So, I mean, converting um, the masses was a major uh, goal. And so what do, you, what, what do you need to do that? Well, you know, one of the things you need is to be able to tell a story in an engaging way. And so... Uh, something like uh, the biblical texts become all the more important if what you want to do is not only um, perpetuate your belief system, but expand it. Yeah. Well, there's only two ways to grow a religion, <laughs> through 
through conversion or conquering or having more babies. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. And uh, Christianity <laughs> covers them both. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you have this term, Jesu venerationism or Jesu venerationism. What, it, how is Jesus different from Noah, Moses, Abraham, the other major figures? Well, he is revered as a much higher level. And in fact, it depends on which branch you're looking at. I mean, you know, in traditional Judaism, some branches there, you may have just been looked on as a rabbi of sorts. Um, others uh, uh, saw him as a, a prophet. Uh, others saw him as a messiah. And uh, some uh, even saw him as an aspect of God. Um, all these different interpretations of Jesus um, dependent on which branch of uh, religion you were adhering to. And, um, I mean, he must have been a remarkable man. Uh, it, it is, uh, um, so many people have written about him. Um, but, uh, um, again, it depends on which uh, belief system you adhere to, uh, how you interpret the man, Jesus. Mm-hmm. Certainly, uh, Jews don't accept him as the Messiah. And when I asked modern Jews, which I do, <laughs> why mm -hmm. not? They said, well, that's mm -hmm. not what the Old Testament prophesizes about what the Messiah will be like. It's not just this right. kind of, uh, uh, you know, rabbi, teacher, carpenter, regular kind mm -hmm. of guy, but a conquering warrior. That's right. You know, but, yeah, but nevertheless, he must have been a remarkable man. I mean, even Richard Dawkins agrees with that. <laughs> yes, uh, right. <laughs> Well, certainly influential, and maybe you might say advance for his time, more more feminism in his writings and more, uh, let's say, tolerance of differences and, you know, less judgmental than others, say, a friendlier New Testament God versus the angry Old Testament God. That's true. And, and the rendition of him does uh, take on more and more life um, the farther after his death you go. At, most of this wasn't written during his uh, lifetime. Most of this was written by people uh, well after his death. Um, yeah. Or by some, by some people that never even met him, you know. Right. Right. Here is my quoting of you from your book, or my next book. Jesus was a great spiritual teacher who had a profound effect on many people, writes Lance Grande in his magisterial The Evolution of Religions admitting that he became what is probably the most influential person in history. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. Mm -hmm. Muhammad would be up there also for the same reason. <laughs> uh, but mm -hmm. this says nothing about the verisimilitude, this is me writing now, but this says nothing about the verisimilitude of the miracle claims made in Jesus' name. In fact, as Grande notes, neither during his own lifetime, 4 BC to 30 CE, no, uh, yeah, nor in the earliest writings of the New Testament by Paul were miracle claims made in Jesus' name. Even Paul's mention of the resurrection of Jesus was described in 1 Corinthians 15.44 as a spiritual event rather than a literal one. Quote, it is, a, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Close quote from Paul. In Paul's writings about Christ, says Grande, he speaks of him in a mystical sense, as a spiritual entity of human consciousness. Close quote from you. Many contemporary groups, in fact, saw, this is you now, saw Christ as a spirit that possessed the man Jesus at his baptism and left him before his death at the crucifixion, called separationism. But since political monarchs of the first century CE were treated as divine, Christian proselytizers began to refer to Jesus as the king of kings. And so came to pass, this is me writing, so came to pass from the Book of Mormon, <laughs> the deification of an otherwise mortal man. Here's how Grande recaps the transformation, quoting you. Reports of specific miracles only began to appear several decades after the death of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, written in 65 to 70 CE, and in later Gospels, 80 to 100 CE. This suggests that stories of miracles, for example, controlling the weather, creating loaves and fishes out of nothing, turning water into wine, healing the sick, and raising the physical dead, were layered into the story of Jesus as expressions of an ultimate God experience. And then one last quote from you. 
uh, as I preface it with, and it is typical of myths in the making, in the retelling across people, spaces, and generations, layers of improbability are added as a test of faith, now quoting you. Once the stories of miracles began to appear in early Christianity, they, could, uh, they were retold repeatedly until they became ingrained beliefs. More stories were added, such as miracles about singing angels, stars announcing earthly happenings, and even a fetus, that of John the Baptist in his mother Elizabeth's womb, leaping to acknowledge the anticipated power of another fetus, that of Jesus in his mother Mary, mother Mary's womb. These details, many, many of which probably began as metaphorical lessons, gradually became accepted by many followers as literal historic truths. It is probable that some of these stories were never intended as documents of historical fact, close quote from you. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's exactly right. You know, but of course, Christians go, no, 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 I'm not having any of this. <laughs> <laughs> Ours is the real one. Okay, yeah. But clearly, obviously, you know, these have stories have predecessors to them. They have meaning in their own right. And I guess here you would say that's just another added layer of ours is special because we have yeah. this one thing right there. And all these, all these major branches of what I refer to as J, so venerationism, uh, see Jesus in one special way or another. I mean, Islam sees him as the penultimate prophet just before um, Muhammad. Um, there was another major uh, branch, um, the biblical demiurgism, who saw him uh, as a man um, who was uh, um, who received the spirit of Christ after he was born, um, who left him again just before the crucifixion. I mean, there's so many different ways of looking at this, and uh, but again, you had to be be careful too uh, that that you uh, look at him in the right way, according to some some branches. Um, um, this proved to be uh, detrimental to say biblical demiurgism because. Uh, uh, their beliefs were so different. Um, they had a kind of a binatarian view of of religion, where there was a good God and a bad God, and uh, Jesus was a, a, an emanation of the good God. And um, um, they were basically driven to ex extinction ultimately because they were persecuted heavily by by um, uh, the uh, conquests of uh, Christians who thought that they were all heretics. So. Uh, it, it's it's a tricky thing, um, this diversification of ideology, because sometimes uh, um, uh, different branches can be tolerant of others, but sometimes they're just absolutely not. And key figures like uh, Jesus, um, it can be highly offensive to some if you simply have a different view of what his nature was. Yeah, I like these pictures you have of d different renditions of Jesus. <laughs> This one yeah. in the far inside there is probably the most accurate. I mean, an Eastern right. Mediterranean first century Jew would not look like one of the Bee Gees. Right. Right? It, <laughs> it, it should have been a dark, fairly dark skinned, um, you know, yeah. uh, short haired person. But <laughs> over time, he was sort of uh, made into this lighter haired Caucasian, uh, you know, and it, you know, it's just the way people, people like to modify things to the familiar, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, you have to take these stories in context as literary truth, maybe rather than empirical, because if people like me ask, how is it that that God could Jesus could be man and God, this Trinity problem? Uh, you know, didn't Aristotle say, you know, a, a is a and you can't be non a and a at the same time. How is this, you know, and, 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 and so forth? Or uh, let me get this straight. So, you know, God sacrificed himself because Jesus is God. To himself, because he's God, and why did he do this to save us from himself? It's like w what? <laughs> I mean, it's just like yeah. <laughs> Trinitarianism is another one of those odd concepts that I mean, in in original apostolic uh, Christianity, uh, that I did didn't exist. I mean, it came in later on, um, and then its acceptance or rejection was a powerful uh, factor in. And diversification of of uh, Abrahamic uh, um, Chris, Abrahamic uh, uh, Paul, monotheism over time. Mm -hmm. um, you had um, yeah. It okay. 
Yeah, well, get, get, give us the bigger. Okay, let's just kind of cruise through as we're coming up on two hours here because I want to get to your last chapter uh, of, you know, the rise of Roman Catholicism and then the Reformation and those divisions and then Anglicanism when Henry VIII wanted a divorce and so on. And here, here we have the branches of Christianity. Yeah, Christianity continued to see a lot of, of um, diversification, of course. Um, we see this going in so many different directions based on different interpretations of biblical verse or uh, adoption of different uh, um, um, ways of new ways of interpreting scripture. Um, uh, people, the uh, derivation from new uh, um, uh, founders of various branches. I mean, all of these things serve to continue this diversification. Um, we also had the rise of these ecumenical councils that were supported by Roman emperors um, early on that were official meetings of major um, entities, um, bishops, to decide uh, which beliefs were uh, acceptable and which ones weren't. And the result of those were often major divergences uh, among Christian sects and branches. Um, these these things happen over and over again. Um, uh, and a lot of these branches claim to be the orthodox version of Christianity because they all want to say that they were the correct ones. But in fact, um, it's hard to say which was original. I guess Roman Catholicism often claims to be the original, partly because they are um, one of the most successful today. But it's hard to say uh, which ideological um, components were original and which ones were add-ons or modifications later. Right. So you get the uh, first big split with the Reformation and then the next split with the Church of England, Anglicanism. And then you have modern religions. So I, I was glad to see you have Unitarianism. You know, Darwin was raised as a Unitarian um, mm -hmm. a, a, to, to counter the problems uh, with Trinitarianism. And then you have Mormonism, um, which I've, I'm always fascinated by, because uh, it's it's recent enough that you can see the origin story. And you're like, uh, no, 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 come on. I mean, this guy put his face in a hat with the magic stones to translate these golden plates from ancient uh, hieroglyphics to modern English and so on. And, and yeah, I mean, the Book of Mormon, not the play. <laughs> which is great. <laughs> uh, but the actual one, you know, I, I mean, people, the Mormons that tell me about it, they, they, they just think it's a, an incredible book. I just can't get through it. Uh, and so, but you know, again, it, it also teaches that in 600 BCE, the Israelites came to America as two mm -hmm. warring factions, the Nephites and the Lamanites, and that Jesus came to America after his resurrection to preach. The Lamanites went on to become the people we know as pre-Columbian indigenous Americans Today, more than 100 million copies of the Book of Mormon have been distributed around the world. Okay, we know that story is wrong. It's absolutely 100% wrong. We know from fossils, from genetics, <laughs> you know, the, the Native Americans are not Israelis, uh, lost tribes. But it just shows the never-ending process of cultures trying to uh, um, take over these belief systems that are so they understand are so important to people's lives. And so, well, let's bring... Let's bring uh, the fundamental elements of Christianity and embed it in the Americas. Okay, well, I guess that was an inevitable thing to happen sooner or later because of cultural favoritism. But uh, um, yeah, the, it, it never ceases to amaze me all the different directions that these these things can go in. Yeah, yeah. My other favorite story about that is the you know that uh, Joseph Smith gets the revelation from God that he has to have a celestial marriage, <laughs> plural marriage, <laughs> right when he's already. He's married and he's seen somebody else already. You know, God told me, you know, a guy's got to do what a guy's got to do when God tells him. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, and then, uh, you know, Utah wants to become a, a, a state in the union in 1890. And the federal government said, you can't have that polytheism, that, uh, <laughs> sorry, polygamy thing. And they go, oh, well, we got another revelation from God. He changed his mind about polygamy. He's ba We're back to monogamy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did he? Right. And then, you know, blacks were not allowed to be ministers in the Church of Mormon until the Civil Rights Movement. Then they go, well, you know, we got another revelation from God. He thinks, yeah. you know, blacks are equal now. Oh, is that right? So it's obviously, <laughs> I mean, it's, I, it's good news. I mean, it's progress, you know, but it's obviously culturally bound. 
And, and another th confusing thing, too, that I, I, you brought up Unitarianism, I know. Um, sometimes these terms are used in, in a way that might indicate an actual branch, and sometimes they're just used as characteristics. I mean, the characteristic of Unitarianism is not a single branch of religion. There are many different branches of, say, monotheism that adopted Unitarian characteristics um, which is one of the reasons I listed that in a separate place in the book, because these are things that are going to require additional study. I mean, I, I took a, perhaps a novel, broad approach to looking at different religions, but I do not claim to have looked at and solved all the diversity um, interpretations here. There are some that are in need of much more work. And uh, sometimes people who study culture dis dismiss, dismiss looking at, at culture in an evolutionary way uh, because they say, well, there have been too many instances where different religions have merged, for example. But in fact, um, I think in most cases, this perception of merging is an oversimplification of uh, of different branching events. Um, there are, um, for example, uh, different sects of Buddhism and Christianity that have been hypothesized to have merged. But in fact, what it, it probably is, is one branch of Buddhism that's, that's developed some aspects of Christianity and a branch of Christianity that's develop some aspects of Buddhism, it's a more complex picture that still needs to be delineated by future workers. And those are things where I think there's a lot more work that still needs to be done. But it's not unlike the example I gave of flight earlier. Um, you know, insects, birds, and bats didn't converge. They all independently developed a flight characteristic. And distinguishing those characteristics which are separately acquired from those that are actually um, representing one uh, uniquely derived characteristic are, are again, one of the, the challenges going forward for uh, deciphering the interrelationships of uh, these things uh, in more detail. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then you write about evangelicalism, which I was glad to see because that's what I was <laughs> uh, for seven years. Also known as pietism is a series of distinctly related Protestant branches that all claim a born-again experience. Yep, a form of personal conversion to seeing the Bible as the sole authority in matters of faith. They are often the product of revivalist or great awakening movements. What are great awakening movements or revival? What triggers them? Revivalist movements um, yeah. uh, might not be the same as a Great Awakening movement, but um, uh, revivalist movements, I, I think that's merely uh, um, a movement that is, I think, trying to re-inject some sort of enthusiasm towards a, a particular uh, belief system going forward. Um, and... Um, you know, I th I think again, it's not a single branch. It's it's just a characteristic that develops yeah, in, yeah. in many different. Um, many I remember different, being part uh, of that. Branches. It was part part of it was kind of a new age thing, and also the recognition that organized religions are kind of stultifying and rigid and maybe too politicized, and that it's just you and God and the Bible. That's it. For, don't, you don't need to go to church. You can just go to a a Bible session with people and read the Bible and sing songs mm -hmm. and pray and that kind of stuff. You know, it's, that's, I, I think, yeah. That's, yeah, it's one of the complications because, you know, one of the things I have to do in doing a study like I did was, first of all, admit that I'm only looking at basic ideologies from where they start. But these things go in a million different directions on a personal level. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody might be a, say, a Roman Catholic in principle, or believe that they're a Roman Catholic, or register themselves as a Roman Catholic, but you know they may 
ex accept um, um, fully accept certain things that are rejected uh, by uh, Orthodox uh, um, Catholicism um, on a personal level. What does that mean? Does that mean that, okay, um, here's yet another complex part of this? Uh, well, it might mean that every person has their own kind of separate belief system, in a sense, but that's, again, no different in, from in biology, where everybody has their own um, genetic pattern. Um, but what we do is we look at the major similarities of organisms and produce our, our specific groups. Um, and uh, in culture, I think we do the same. We, we look at these major um, cultural components. Uh, in the case of history of religion, we look at these major belief systems, and uh, that's what we're trying to organize in some sort of, of uh, uh, phylogeny or relationship here. Yeah, I thought you did that very well. Okay, Lance, you've been very generous with your time at two hours here. Let's just wrap it up with your four generalizations in the final pages of your book. Organized religions are historically related at one ideological level or another as illustrated by your trees. Two, largest major branches today were historically intertwined with major political powers. Three, authority of women declined with the rise of male-dominated pantheons, empires, clergies, and caliphates. And four, religion played a role in our species' early ability to adapt to its social and physical environment. Tribalism was a competitive advantage for early humans in which communal societies that developed agriculture, commerce, Educational facilities and armies outcompeted less communitarian groups. Okay, what's the future of religion as you see it? I know prophecy is a lost art; <laughs> it probably shouldn't be practiced by scientists. But give us your, you know, kind of bigger picture going forward. What might the world hold for the future of religion? Well, I th I think the way I would look at it is, uh, what's its role in the uh, successful future of human culture, and um, I think because of the way the world has changed today, it's such a different world than it was uh, even centuries ago. And um, what once was a, uh, a um, benefit of religion to society, um, now in some respects is not so much so. Uh, and that component of it that is no longer really beneficial is this highly tribalistic element. The fact that, um, in some instances, tribalism uh, causes these uh, the uh, uh, global violence or inability to attack uh, global uh, problems with global solutions. I mean, clearly there are problems today that require global solutions. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the um, you know uh, um, regional poverty overpopulation, pollution, um, and regional violence, all of these things, uh, when they are enhanced by religious differences, that's something we have to deal with somehow. And how do we do it? Well, I think we need a more pluralistic attitude about certain things, uh, religion being one of them. And how do we develop that? I think we need a deeper and broader understanding of how all of these things are related and what their actual histories were. So what I'm hoping is in the future, um, as a species, we can learn to at least better um, appreciate our own histories as well as the histories of, of others outside of our personal um, um, histories and uh, somehow adapt better to the uh, modern environment that we're living in today. Otherwise, we're risking uh, uh, pushing ourselves to extinction. Yeah. Well, I hope you're right, Lance. Do you think there's any hope for a non-supernatural like religion, something like the Gaia hypothesis or whatever you want to call it, turn that into a religion or secular humanism, enlightenment humanism as a quasi-religion to unite people? Well, all these things are, are religions in a way. I mean, they're, in a way, they're a, a return to uh, animistic um uh, elements, you know, with oh, a right. belief that, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that was what, uh, what, uh, 
Graham Harvey calls new animism. Basically, it's just looking at all of that as being a religion of sorts. And, oh, uh, like Levlock's idea of the uh, Earth Mother Goddess. That's a lie. Yeah. Guyanism is basically yet another um, form of that. So, um, but again, I, I'd, I'd also modify that with, I would um, include that, but not to the exclusion of everything else, because people are never all going to be on the same page. And so, I, I, and, and things are going to continue to diversify. Again, diversification over time is a law of human society. It, it never changes. And so what I hope we can do is learn to better deal with that fact and deal with, deal with that uh, there's, we have to be tolerant of the diversity that not only exists but continues to exist, as long as it's not one that is, is uh, harmful to the development of human society. Well put, Lance. Good place to end it. There's your next book, uh, Workbooks on How to Create Your Own <laughs> uh, Secular Religion <laughs> to Save Humanity from Itself. <laughs> uh, oh, well, thanks so much, Michael. It's been really a pleasure uh, talking to you today about this. Unbelievably super interesting. Su su such an important topic, huge topic.